The Western countries promised Uganda to invest in constructing and developing one of the biggest oil pipelines. It was called the East African Crude Oil Pipeline and had a budget of $5 billion. Uganda was made to believe that the U.S. would take care of all the investments so Uganda's crude oil could be transported to Tanzania, which has access to the Indian Ocean. From that, the crude oil could reach the entire world, bringing billions of dollars to Uganda and boosting its economy. However, Uganda did something the Western countries did not like. And as expected, since the Western countries invested to use it as leverage later, they announced to suspend the investment. It meant a complete halt of the pipeline construction, ending all chances for Uganda to rise. That's when China came forward to help and assist Uganda, shocking the West. However, things are not quite as simple as it sounds. So, why did the West suspend the investment? How important is this pipeline? And why is China helping Uganda? Watch this video because it will change how you think about Uganda, China, and Western countries. Let's get started. First, let's understand what ECOP or East African Crude Oil Pipeline really is. Believe us, it will surprise you. The East African Crude Oil Pipeline, ECOP, also known as the Uganda-Tanzania Crude Oil Pipeline, is a major crude oil pipeline project that's been in the works since 2013. A symbolic move was made by laying the foundation stone in 2017, and the goal is clear. Transport crude oil from Uganda's Talenga and Kingfisher oil fields to the port of Tonga in Tanzania, right on the Indian Ocean. From that, this crude oil would be supplied to the entire world. Uganda is diving into oil development, particularly with Tilenga, operated by Total Energies and Kingfisher, under the wing of the China National Offshore Oil Corporation. In the ownership game, Total Energies claims the lion's share at 65%, Uganda's National Oil Company gets 15%, Tanzania also grabs 15%, and Knuk takes home 5%. This project's bill has shot up to a whopping $5 billion. Interestingly, 24 banks from the West decided to take a step back, but Standard Bank and the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China came in their place. When this master project is done, it will break records as the world's longest electrically heated crude oil pipeline. Back in March 2016, the EACOP had its starting point all planned out in Busaruka sub-county, Hoima district, at Lake Albert, in Uganda's western region. The pipeline's journey includes the Albertine Rift, passing through Rakai District in Uganda, hitting Bukoba in Tanzania, making a loop around the southern shores of Lake Victoria, and finally, ending the party on the Chongoliani Peninsula near the port of Tanga, covering a whopping 1,410 kilometers. The Kingfisher oil field was discovered in 2006 on the eastern bank of Lake Albert, right on the border between Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Moving northeast of Kingfisher, you will find the Tilenga oil fields in the Belisa and Nwoya districts. Total Energies is taking the lead here with a 56.6% stake, teaming up with Sinuk and Yunok. Their plan? Develop six fields, including one smack in the middle of Murchison Falls National Park, and drill about 400 wells from 31 locations. Fast forward to December 2021, and the Ugandan parliament puts its stamp on the East African Crude Oil Pipeline Special Provisions Bill, steering the ship for the country's involvement in the estimated $3.5 billion ECOP construction, operations and maintenance. Uganda's contribution is pegged at $293 million with $130 million already in the bank. Tanzania had played a similar card, passing its law in August 2021. As of March 2016, the plan was to initiate construction in August 2016, anticipating a three-year timeline with a budget of $4 billion. This substantial investment was expected to create approximately 15,000 construction jobs and offer 1,000 to 2,000 permanent positions. The Daily Monitor newspaper reported that Total ENP was prepared to commit a significant $4 billion to fund the ECOP construction. By July 2016, Following high-level discussions led by the oil ministers of Tanzania and Uganda in Uima, the announcement came that construction of the 1,443-kilometer pipeline would kick off in January 2017. The overarching plan was to complete the project by 2020. 
However, by August 2017, the construction budget for the 1,645-kilometer pipeline had been revised down to $3.5 billion. Fast forward to September 2020, and Total Energies, along with the government of Uganda, signed a host government agreement, paving the way for the final investment decision by the year's end. The laying of the pipeline was expected to begin in the first quarter of 2021. April 2021 witnessed the signing of crucial agreements between Presidents Museveni and Suluhu of Uganda and Tanzania, respectively, alongside key players like Patrick Puyane of Total Energies and Chen Zhuobiao of Sinoak, Uganda. Construction was set to start in July 2021, with the first oil anticipated in 2025. In August 2021, the total project cost ballooned to $5 billion with $2 billion allocated for equity investment from the pipeline owners and the remaining $3 billion to be borrowed from external sources. You see, the East African crude oil pipeline ECOP emerges as a monumental project poised to reshape Uganda's economic landscape and enhance its standing in the global energy sector. This ambitious endeavor, spanning an impressive 1,143 kilometers, envisions the transportation of crude oil from Uganda's prolific Albertine Rift Valley to the strategic Tanzanian port of Tanga on the Indian Ocean. The ECOP is more than just a conduit for oil. It symbolizes a beacon of economic prosperity for Uganda. The pipeline is expected to generate significant revenue through royalties and taxes, potentially ushering in a new era of development and alleviating the persistent burdens of poverty in the country. Job creation is another crucial benefit that the ECOP holds for Uganda. The construction and operation of the pipeline, along with associated oil fields, are anticipated to stimulate a surge in employment opportunities, particularly in rural communities. This influx of skilled labor would not only boost the economy, but also foster human capital development and skills transfer. The EACOP also holds the potential to diversify Uganda's economy, which is currently heavily reliant on agriculture. The establishment of the oil industry would add a new dimension to the country's economic base, making it less susceptible to fluctuations in the agricultural sector. This diversification would enhance resilience and stability in the economy. The prospect of energy security also binds with the IACOP. Currently, Uganda heavily depends on imported oil, leaving it vulnerable to fluctuations in global oil prices and supply disruptions. The pipeline would empower Uganda to produce its own oil, reducing reliance on external sources and fostering energy independence. That's because the pipeline would bring an oil refinery for Uganda, which will offer sufficient oil for it to be used for the country. This newfound autonomy would translate into cost savings and a more secure energy supply for the country. The ECOP also holds the promise of strengthening regional cooperation between Uganda and Tanzania. The two nations bound by the pipeline's construction and operation would forge deeper ties, fostering collaboration in trade, infrastructure development, and security. This strengthened alliance could pave the way for further economic integration and shared prosperity. But before you know how China has saved the pipeline, you should first know how the West falsely promised and tried to exploit the pipeline. The pipeline initially garnered considerable interest from Western nations, notably the United States, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Western countries committed financial resources to the project through loans and grants. For instance, France's development agency, AFD, extended a $325 million loan to facilitate the development of the EACOP. What's more, the Western countries pledged to mitigate the financial risks associated with the EACOP project by offering guarantees and insurance. The World Bank's Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, MIGA for instance, has provided insurance against political risks, shielding investors from potential losses due to political instability or unforeseen circumstances. However, despite having this insurance, the Western countries suspended their investments. You will know about more details shortly in making false promises and taking them to another level of fantasy, Western country is promised to contribute their expertise to support the development and implementation of the EACOP project. The UK government, for instance, promised to provide technical assistance to the Ugandan government, focusing on environmental and social safeguards 
to minimize the negative impacts of the project. The West initially wanted to invest because it wanted to exploit the pipeline. The ECOP project held the promise of unlocking new oil reserves in Uganda, a prospect that appealed to Western countries seeking to diversify their energy sources and reduce dependence on oil from the Middle East. Gaining access to these reserves could have enhanced energy security and stability for Western nations. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. The ECOP project also offered economic growth and development in Uganda and Tanzania, the two primary countries involved. The construction and operation of the pipeline were expected to generate employment opportunities, boost government revenue, and stimulate investment in various sectors of the economy, fostering overall economic prosperity in the region. That's when the Western countries betrayed Uganda. The East African crude oil pipeline was initially conceived as a groundbreaking infrastructure project designed to transport crude oil from Uganda's Albertine Rift Valley to the Tanzanian port of Tanga on the Indian Ocean. This ambitious undertaking piqued the interest of several Western countries, including France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. However, despite their initial expressions of interest, these nations ultimately chose to withdraw their financial support. This was done after spreading great propaganda about the pipeline. At the forefront of the propaganda by Western countries was the potential environmental impacts of the ECOP project. The pipeline's route cuts through sensitive ecosystems, including wetlands and forests, raising worries about deforestation, habitat loss, and disruption of wildlife corridors. Environmentalists cautioned that the project could lead to a decline in biodiversity, threaten endangered species, and exacerbate climate change through the release of greenhouse gases associated with oil production and transportation. Western countries also expressed concerns about the social implications of the EA COP project, particularly regarding the potential displacement of communities along the pipeline's route. But this was also a part of the propaganda to end investment and ensure that Uganda does not construct the pipeline on its own. Therefore, international environment organizations were given the task by the West to make the pipeline notorious. The ultimate goal was to make the pipeline construction impossible so Uganda could never benefit from it. Beyond environmental and social concerns, Western countries also took into account the financial risks associated with the ECOP project. The project was deemed a high-risk investment due to political instability in the region, potential cost overruns, and fluctuations in global oil prices. These factors raised doubts about the project's financial viability and the potential for investors to recoup their investments. The presented argument was that the pipeline was harmful to the country's environment. It should have been asked why the Western countries started a project that they thought was harmful to the environment. Above all, it showed the hypocrisy of the West, pretending that it cared about the environment but not the people of Uganda, who needed the pipeline to improve the quality of life. The decision by Western countries to abandon their financial support from the East African Crude Oil Pipeline Project originated from a junction of environmental, social, and financial concerns. These concerns were often presented in a way that emphasized the negative outcomes of the project, while downplaying its potential benefits. What's more, the existence of other pipelines globally, including those in Western countries, raises questions about the selective criticism of EACOP. If oil pipelines are harmful to the environment, then why not the International Environment Organization criticize and advocate shutting down all the pipelines in the United States? Well, that's because the Western countries have kept these organizations as lapdogs that can be used to make projects of African countries notorious. But China has stepped in to save the pipeline. China has announced that Chinese lenders will contribute over half of the $3 billion debt required by Uganda for the construction of a crude oil pipeline, stepping in after Western financiers withdrew support due to strong opposition from environmental groups. According to Uganda's Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, the East African nation expects to finalize discussions with the China Export and Credit Insurance Corporation and the Export-Import Bank of China. Irene Bati, the ministry's permanent secretary, stated that Sinosur, the Chinese state-owned provider of export credit insurance, is collaborating with Exim Bank to finance the pipeline, constituting the largest portion, above 50% of the debt. 
you should know that Uganda requires approximately $5 billion for the pipeline, stretching from Lake Albert's oil fields to a storage and loading terminal in the Tanzanian port of Tanga. The financing is structured at a 60-40 debt-to-equity ratio, with $3 billion secured as debt and the remaining $2 billion to be financed by shareholders through equity contributions. Total Energies holds a 62% interest in the pipeline, with the Uganda National Oil Company and Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation holding 15% each and the Chinese oil giant, China National Offshore, Oil Corporation having 8%. The 1,443 kilometer pipeline is designed to transport crude oil from Uganda's Lake Albert oil fields in northwest Uganda to Tanga in Tanzania on the Indian Ocean, where the oil will be further sold to global markets. In addition to the Chinese lenders, Batibi mentioned that Uganda anticipates securing funding from Saudi Arabia's Islamic Development Bank and various African banks, including the African Export-Import Bank. Uganda said that it did see some Western banks withdrawing from supporting the project, but it always looked at its other friends. However, it was only in the preceding year that the partners unveiled a final investment decision of $10 billion for the project encompassing the development of the oil field and the construction of the pipeline to transport crude oil extracted from Hoima in western Uganda. Sunak oversees the Kingfisher oil field situated on the eastern shores of Lake Albert in Uganda. An estimated investment of $2-3 billion will be made to develop the oil field, targeting a peak production of 40,000 barrels per day. The larger Telenga oil field is operated by the French oil multinational Total Energies, with an estimated development cost ranging from $4 billion to $6 billion. It is anticipated to produce 190,000 barrels per day. The initiation of drilling, development, and production wells for Kingfisher and Telenga began in January and June 2023, respectively. The landlocked East African nation now aspires to become an oil exporting nation by 2025. South Africa's Standard Bank and the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China are acting as financial advisors and lead debt arrangers for ECOP, as reported by BankTrack, an organization focused on tracking, campaigning, and supporting NGOs regarding banks and their financed activities. Japan's Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation also rejected financing the project though it remains unclear if it still serves as one of the debt arrangers and advisors. The issue reached the European Parliament last year, prompting legislators to pass a resolution urging a halt to the project due to environmental and human rights concerns. They also cautioned Total Energies against supporting the project. This scenario highlights the irony in the European Parliament's opposition to the East African crude oil pipeline project, given that Western countries, including European nations, had previously provided insurance against political risks associated with the project. The West's hypocritical nature should be mentioned here. As the insurance was given about political situations, the European Parliament carefully used the environmental excuse to suspend investment. This shows how far the Western countries can go in their cheating and manipulation and playing double games. In response to calls from Western countries for Uganda to abandon its oil plans, Uganda argues that this approach doesn't consider the entire picture. Irene Batibe stated, That will be very unfair. It will no longer be a just energy transition. It will be an unjust energy transition. She added that Uganda believes the oil and gas sector can coexist with its plans for renewable energy, emphasizing the need for a financing plan for the transition. What's more, if oil and gas are harmful to the environment, why doesn't the United States give up on selling oil and LNG to Europe and the world, which brings it billions of dollars? Hypocrisy is the answer. In support of Uganda's projects, the Chinese embassy in Uganda criticized the European Union last year for attempting to interfere with the development of Uganda's oil ambitions. Chinese ambassador to Uganda Zhang Lijong stated that the EU should not use the excuse of environmental and human rights issues to block development of the oil fields and the pipeline. But why did the West suspend investment? Well, it was a type of punishment for the actions Uganda took. Back in 2021, Uganda removed the United States ambassador to Uganda, Deborah Malik, 
alleging interference in Uganda's internal affairs. The Ugandan government accused Malik of making inflammatory statements and engaging in acts incompatible with the conduct of a foreign envoy. What's more, in 2022, Uganda suspended collaboration with the European Union in response to sanctions imposed over human rights abuses. The Ugandan government criticized the EU for hypocrisy and interfering in Uganda's internal affairs. The last nail to the coffin was Uganda's military entering cooperation with Russia, perceived as a rebuff to the West. The agreement includes provisions for training, joint exercises, and the exchange of military equipment. Even Uganda exercised its autonomy and power, criticizing Western countries and international forums. It increasingly expressed criticism of Western nations in international forums, accusing them of hypocrisy and neo-colonialism. For instance, in 2022, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni addressed the United Nations General Assembly, accusing the West of exploiting Africa and imposing its will on the continent. These actions have prompted speculation that Uganda is shifting away from its traditional alliance with the West toward closer ties with Russia and China. But the West has a habit of expecting subordination, especially from the African countries. Since Uganda rose up and the West feared the pipeline would make it bold, it decided to suspend the investment. What do you think? Is China a reliable partner for Uganda? Whether Uganda should sell its crude oil to Western countries once the pipeline is constructed or punish them? Let us know your thoughts on how Uganda should benefit from the pipeline and become one of the most developed countries. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about the black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.